Huh? What's going on? Wake up, mate! The war has begun, so quickly man the cannons and give them hell! Oh, I'm excited, oh, yeah, mate. Oh, yeah, I hope they got go a cup of tea at the end of the hallway. War? Oh god, okay, just give me a second, I gotta change it to my uniform and I'll be I'll be right there. Okay. Wait, what? Oh, hey Charles. Wait, why aren't you guys manning the cannons? The cannons? What are you Oh, you mean the war? I already finished it, matey. The war is over? Yeah, mate. Hey, you joining this round to what? This bloke is about to wager his soul. Ah, oh, bollocks. A deal said deal, sir. No, wait, wait, wait. Can I go to bed again? Historically Facts, Part 5. Welcome to the late 19th century. And welcome to Great Britain. The land of industrial revolution, the land of economic opportunities, and the land of overcrowded cities. With many, many rats. You know what else Britain has many of? Colonies. How many? Very many. Approximately 22% of all of Earth's land area. It's the biggest empire that the world has ever seen. And within that humongous empire is a small island called Zanzibar. Just off the coast of Tanzania, Zanzibar was the trade center of the Indian Ocean, connecting African, Indian and Asian traders all in one spot. This made the island crucial for the British colonists, as it strengthened their position in the African trading world. But that wasn't the sole reason the British wanted the island. There was also slavery. No, 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 no. The British didn't want to establish it. They wanted to abolish it. Around the year 1800, the British had a change of heart and decided that maybe tearing families apart and shipping them across the world to work till they die of exhaustion wasn't that humanitarian. So, after a good old talk with abolitionists like Thomas Clarkson, Grenfell Sharp and William Wilberforce, they decided that slaves are indeed also human, and passed a law that made it illegal to have slaves in the Great British Empire. This simultaneously resulted in a new spark in the hearts of the British people. We shall free the world of slavery and have every man, and later on maybe also women, made equal. This brings us back to Zanzibar. Turns out, just because the British quit slavery doesn't mean the local sultan and many traders settled in Zanzibar did themselves as well. And that was a problem for the British, as slavery is very inhuman and not allowed because of the British law. Now, the easy way to deal with this problem is to immediately force every trader and wealthy person on the island to give up their main source of income so the island would no longer be illegal. But that has a slight side effect of rebelling and guerrilla warfare. And we wouldn't want to somehow end up in a war, would we? This brings us to the second, less rebellious option. Admiral Harry Rawson. Admiral Rawson was the chief of command at the Cape of Good Hope station in southern Africa, which meant that he was the head of the British fleet responsible for the waters around the African countries. What if instead of making slave trading illegal, we just sent multiple ships patrolling the seas around East Africa to intercept any incoming slave ships, effectively causing slave trading to come to a halt without coming across as evil colonists? Sounds like a smart plan, actually. But won't the local sultan oppose this? He would, if he could. When Britain acquired Zanzibar, it's not like they walked into the palace of the sultan and said, hey man, we want to set up a colony here so we can get richer. Do you consent to this very one-sided agreement? No, it went more like this. Hey Germany. Ah, scheiße. <clears throat> oh, Great Britain. I heard you're also trying to set up colonies in Africa. Yes, my dear friend. And I'll tell you what, if you take this part of East Africa, I'll take this, 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 and also this. Huh. If you refuse, I will use my superior naval force to make your life a living hell. Uh, you know us, you make an outstanding argument. Deal. Oh, hello, Sultan Hamad bin Tubaini. I own this island now. Any objections? You sure? Okay, nice. But wait a minute. If the British seized ownership of the island, why is the Sultan still here? To once again avoid any unnecessary warfare, which we certainly wouldn't want to happen, 
They kept the Sultan in place to create the illusion that the Zanzibaris were still governed by their good old slave-loving Sultan. Though, in reality, he was more like a puppet of the British to control the population. As long as the local Sultan would listen to the British, nothing bad would ever happen. And he's dead. How did he die? Suddenly. AKA probably poisoned by his cousin, Khalid bin Bargash. Gosh, poisoned by a family relative? We have never seen that before in history. All right, so the Sultan is dead, which means the British lost their puppet. Very upsetting. Not war triggering upsetting, but still pretty bad. Time to get a new Sultan elected. Here are our two choices. We have Hamoud bin Mohammed, a pro-British anti-slavery candidate, or Khalid bin Bargash, the same dude who poisoned the previous Sultan, and not to mention, really didn't like the British. Why did he hate the British so much? Well, when Ali bin Said, the Sultan before the poisoned one died, died, the British, just like now, had two choices. A pro-British, anti-slavery candidate, or Prince Khalid bin Bargash. Khalid was the only son of a previous Sultan, which made him a prince and, in his opinion, the successor of the throne. The British didn't think so, and favored Hamid bin Tuwaini a lot more. Khalid really didn't like that, and the response to the British denying his sultanship, stormed the palace and barricaded himself inside till the British gave him the throne. Luckily, the British managed to smooth talk the way to Khalid giving up the throne anyway, so unnecessary blood wasn't shed. But now, the same thing happened to Khalid again, and he wasn't about to let his sultanship be taken away for a second time. So, after hearing the British favored Hamoud bin Mohammed over him, he once again, though now with over 3,000 men and women, stormed the palace and locked themselves inside. The British initially tried to once again sweet talk Khalid into leaving the palace, but Khalid had enough of the British and flat out ignored them this time. This was extremely problematic for the colonizer, as they had to get a sultan in power that aligned with their ideals. After asking Khalid to leave again, presumably now with a bouquet of flowers, the British turned back to Admiral Harry Rawson. So, yes yeah, sir, this bloke in the palace is not getting out. You think maybe you could somehow convince him to leave? Yeah, no worries mate, I got you. I'll be right there first thing in the morning and uh, for no reason whatsoever, please evacuate all British citizens and merchants from the island, okay? See you tomorrow. Oi mate, my name is Harry, and those are my five ships. We give you one final hour to leave, or we will do it the good old fashioned way, alright? Whereas Khalid responded, and I quote, We have no intentions of leaving, and we do not believe you would open fire on us. Oh, I'm not sure if you should call our claims a bluff mate. One final hour, do not be a hero. So back to his ships Harry went, waiting for Khalid and his 3,000 supporters to leave the palace. But as time grew closer to 9am, there were no signs of surrendering. Instead, the British noticed the Zanzibari rebels manned the one shore battery they had, and that a Zanzibari warship began to position itself within the formation of the five ships. Very questionable behavior. I sure wonder why they are doing that. Oh hey, would you look at the time. It's time for... The gunboats Raccoon, Trush and Sparrow simultaneously opened fire at the palace, where Trush's first shot immediately destroyed the only manned shore battery they had. Even though the 3,000 supporters heavily fortified themselves in the palace, the British high explosive shells obliterated the barricades and caused massive fires throughout the palace, trapping thousands of supporters in the toxic smoke. At 5 past 9 am, so three minutes after the shelling started, the only warship of the Zanzibaris started to lay fire onto the big cruiser that Admiral Rawson was on. However, due to the very outdated weaponry and questionable battle ethics, they didn't even manage to create a dent in the ship's hull. The St. George laid fire back and sunk the enemy ship in approximately four shots. For some reason, a couple minutes later, two small steam launches came to try to take down Trush, but they did it with rifles? What? Needless to say, they were disposed of really quickly as well. And that was all the naval defenses that the Zanzibaris had. What followed was 30 minutes of over 500 high explosive shells continuously fired upon the palace, till one brave Zanzibari climbed up to the roof to take down the rebellers' flag. 
And then the war ended. Yep, the entire war, the shortest war in history, ended in just 38 minutes, with over 500 casualties on the Zanzibari side and only one sailor hurt on the British side, presumably by accidentally dropping a shell on his own foot. In the end, the Anglo-Zanzibar War was the shortest and one of the most one-sided wars in our entire history. Wait a minute, what happened to Khalid? Well, he ran off. Five minutes into the shelling, he just left with his rich buddies and sought refugee at the German embassy, leaving his thousands of supporters to die in the palace. Bro, uncool. After the war, Khalid fled to the German side of Africa, where he continued to live an easy life. Till he got captured by the Allies, who were liberating and possibly trying to take more for themselves in Africa from the Germans in World War I. And got sent to exile to the same island that they sent Napoleon to where Khalid wrote and sent dozens of personal letters to Churchill, begging to be sent home. Whereas the Sigur man responded by sending him to Kenya, where he died. Epic troll. Anyway, 20 minutes after the war ended, Hamoud bin Mohammed ascended to become a sultan and slavery was forever abolished in Zanzibar. This is the bizarre 38 minutes war that caused way, way too many deaths.